Coming up on Network Africa. Zimbabwean opposition wins majority seats in by-elections conducted on Saturday. Top Sudanese security forces withdraw from first Vice President Rick Mashar's residence after being deployed over the weekend. Plus, Ghana ends mandatory face mask wearing in public, among other restrictions. Welcome to the program this week. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin in Zimbabwe, where the Citizens' Coalition for Change, the country's leading opposition party, has won 19 out of the 28 National Assembly seats in the long-delayed parliamentary by-elections. State-owned ZBC TV reported on Sunday night that the CCC has won the majority in Saturday's elections. The nine remaining seats went to the ruling Zimbabwe African National Union Patriot Front, ZANU PF, which still holds a parliamentary majority. Back in 2018, ZANU PF won 145 seats from the 210 available seats in parliament. The parliamentary and local government by elections are seen as a preview of next year's presidential elections, in which the opposition is hoping to overtake ZANU PF, which has been in power since Zimbabwe's independence in 1980. Zimbabwean journalist Nigel Yamutumbu joins us now for more discussions on the by-elections over the weekend. Hello, Nigel. Thank you for speaking to us. Sure. Uh, good to be here. So let's talk about Saturday's by-election. Talk to us about the conduct of the polls that has now given opposition party CCC majority seats. We know there had been intense tension in the lead-up to this election. Yes, um, the political environment uh, actually reached a fever pitch in Zimbabwe, uh, leading to these uh, by-elections, uh, which uh, come at a time when the country is preparing for the general elections that are, are set uh, for next year. So, yes, what was really interesting was to, number one, ascertain the legitimate opposition in Zimbabwe, uh, having uh, most of these by-elections being conducted in places where uh, opposition, uh, one faction of an opposition had recalled uh, other members of parliament. So that was a critical test. Secondly, to gauge uh, the strength of uh, this new uh, opposition political party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, uh, led by Nelson Chamisa, who uh, had been uh, uh, really, you know, taken his, his power from him, members of parliament had been taken, uh, and uh, uh, they had been, you know, his party headquarters and so forth. Uh, but clearly, uh, he made uh, a big political statement as the legitimate uh, uh, leader of the opposition and also made uh, quite a statement uh, to uh, the ruling party, Sano PF, uh, is we here for the 2023 20, elections. But suffice to say, the ruling party also made a statement of its presence in both the urban and rural areas where these elections were contested. Well, we know there have been claims of rigging, vote buying, and even intimidation during Saturday's polls. What is the electoral authority saying about this? Yes, I think for uh, since the turn of the millennium, our elections have been uh, subjected to uh, a lot of uh, scrutiny in terms of the conduct and in terms of the processes, which has led uh, changes to the electoral law. Uh, I think uh, uh, if there is any going to be another change uh, before the 2023 elections, that would mean at every turn uh, there has been uh, uh, changes to the processes uh, that govern the elections in Zimbabwe. Having said that, they 
uh, has been those uh, issues, particularly of vote buying uh, and uh, of uh, intimidation uh, and of busing supporters from uh, uh, different constituencies to vote in new constituencies. There were issues. Uh, with the voters' role. Uh, the Electoral Commission did speak yesterday to some of these issues, uh, pretty much dismissing all of them, uh, saying, well, they conducted the elections in terms of the law, they conducted uh, uh, all the, 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 the necessary processes that are provided for in, in, in these elections. Uh, but yes, the opposition has also come out to say uh, the issues ought to be addressed and to be addressed as a matter of agency. All right, Nigel, just uh, help us understand now what this means for the opposition party, CCC, you know, having the majority seats. Well, um, it, it, it can only give them more impetus. Um, and also some some key uh, lessons uh, uh, going forward. Uh, that number one, because the voter, the voting turnout, voters turnout, was not as anticipated. Uh, it was uh, especially when you're considering the hype uh, that this election had uh, been associated with, the tension, uh, the political rallies that had, uh, uh, that were witnessed leading to these elections. Uh, so it really uh, provided a key lesson that the crowd that rallies does not necessarily translate into voters. And also that they need to be looking at uh, ways of penetrating uh, the rural vote, uh, which uh, by and large uh, remains within the, the, the ruling party. So if they are to stand any meaningful chance uh, of uh, assuming state power, in 2023, uh, they ought to uh, go to the drawing board. Yes, they've made a clear statement, uh, which uh, I'm sure in all intents and purposes, the ruling party, the ZANOPF, is also uh, looking at, uh, will also be looking at mechanisms uh, to try and work on the urban vote, uh, where they've uh, uh, still lost and where they still do not have much ground compared uh, to, the, to the opposition. So all this sets the stage uh, for an epic battle come 2023. All right then, Nigel Yamutumbu, Zimbabwean journalist, thank you for bringing us up to speed. Excellent, thank you, pleasure. South Sudanese security forces have withdrawn from first Vice President Rick Mashar's residence in the capital, Juba, after being deployed to his residence on Saturday evening. Well, according to his press secretary, Kwok Balong, Mr. Mashar reported to his office today and is working normally, even as the Vice President's office is expected to issue a press statement on the matter. Security officers had cordoned off Mr. Mashar's house after he had issued a press statement rejecting President Sarva Kiir's directive on the formation of a national army. And that's a key pillar of a peace deal the two men signed in 2018. Mr. Mashar had accused President Kiir of not equally sharing out positions in the military and the police force as stipulated in the peace agreement. The United Nations is welcoming the declaration by Ethiopia of an indefinite humanitarian truce and the commitment by Tigrayan authorities to a cessation of hostilities. Reading the UN Secretary General statement, Stefan Dujaric, spokesperson for the UN, said that the conflict in Ethiopia has caused terrible suffering for millions of people across several regions. On the situation in Ethiopia, uh, the Secretary General welcomes the declaration by the government of Ethiopia of an indefinite humanitarian truce, effective immediately, and the commitment by Tigrayan authorities to a cessation of hostilities, effective immediately. The conflict in Ethiopia has caused terrible suffering for millions of people across the Afar, Amhara, Tigray, and Benishangul, Gums, and Oromia.
These positive developments must now translate into immediate improvements on the ground. The Secretary General for, therefore reiterates his call for the restoration of public services in Tigray, including banking, electricity, and telecommunications, and calls uh, for all sides to proactively enable and facilitate the delivery of desperately needed humanitarian assistance across the affected areas. The Secretary General urges all parties to the conflict to build on this encouraging development and to make, take the necessary steps towards ending this long-term conflict, a ceasefire, excuse me, steps towards a long-term ceasefire. To health matters now, Ghana is reporting a sustained drop in COVID-19 infections, and that's prompted President Nana Akufo-Addo to announce the removal of the mandatory requirements for face masks to be worn in public. Now, this was among other decisions he announced on Sunday. The president also scrapped the requirement for negative PCR tests for fully vaccinated travelers arriving in the country through the Kotoka International Airport in Accra from Monday. However, he is encouraging Ghanaians to continue observing enhanced hand hygiene practices and also to avoid overcrowded places. Ghana's daily infection rate has been falling steadily since December 2021. The West African country has so far recorded over 160,000 confirmed COVID cases. Fred Smith, head of the health desk at uh, Joy News TV in Accra, joins us now for more on this. Hello, Fred. Thank you for speaking to us. What has been the response of Ghanaians to the lifting of these COVID-19 restrictions? It's been on for a while. Yes, uh, close to two years, and it's, it's not been comfortable for people wearing the face mask. And so there's a lot of joy for many Ghanaians who've been uh, reacting to the president's announcement last night. However, we have uh, some Ghanaians who are also not uh, too excited about this because they believe that lifting the restrictions, especially the one that has to do with the use of face masks or face coverings completely until we are through the Easter season, uh, could take us to a, a position where we might record uh, a spike in cases and therefore uh, maybe a fifth wave happening in Ghana. As it stands, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, we recorded just 17 cases at the last uh, report from the Ghana Health Service. Uh, 10 of those 17 were, were recorded from international travelers. In the communities, we had only seven cases, two of them in Accra, which has previously been the hotspot for infection. So it tells you that uh, Ghana has really, really gone far in terms of dealing with COVID-19. The challenge will be at the airports. Uh, mind you, persons who are fully vaccinated can also contract COVID, but such persons will not be required to take a PCR test before they embark on the journey to Ghana. And when they come to Ghana, they will not be tested at the airport uh, uh, to see what their status is. This is more like saying we are we, we, we are not checking anybody who has COVID so long as you are vaccinated. That's what some Ghanaians are not enthused about. So with these uh, restrictions being lifted, will this be bringing life back to normal? Yes, uh, life is back to normal. Uh, theaters, the funerals, church services, most prayer sessions, and all are resuming at full capacity now. And the president is asking any participant in all of these events and activities to ensure that they have, they have fully vaccinated persons attending. What the Ghana Medical Association is concerned about with this directive, though, is that not all event organizers will be able to check, especially if you are, you are attending a church service, for instance, a crusade, where many people are attending, we don't have the systems in place for us to be able to check each and everyone to be sure that they came. You recall Ghana played Nigeria uh, in the World Cup qualifier a few days ago. At some point in the game, there were people who managed to uh, reportedly break the gates to the stadium and managed to access the facility. So the stadium was uh, above its capacity by close to twice. Uh, such persons, there will be nobody to uh, check their status as vaccinated or not. So that 
it's another difficulty. Otherwise, life is back to normal. Nowhere, nobody wears the face mask. You can uh, visit people, organize conferences and things that were banned for the past two years since we've been fighting COVID. All right, then, uh, Fred Smith with the Joy News TV, Accra. Thank you for speaking to us. Thanks for having me. Still ahead on the program. Archaeologists in Egypt uncover five tombs in the country's Saqqara necropolis. Please join us again. Welcome back to the program. Hundreds of people took to the streets of Johannesburg at the weekend to protest against what they call acts of hate in South Africa. The group, Kopenang Africa Against Xenophobia, comprises several civil society organizations who took a memorandum of demands to the Hillborough Police Station as well as the Johannesburg Central Police Station. Among their demands is the Operation Dudula movement to be called to order by the authorities. Operation Dudula, which seeks to uproot those they refer to as illegal foreign nationals who cause harm to their communities, has been raiding some communities doing just that. <laughs> Rising from the shadows of a ban on an earlier planned march, Kopanang Africa converged on the Hillbrow area of Johannesburg to send out their message. The xenophobic violence and intimidation and threats that have been with us for the last few weeks through Operation Dudula have caused us to want to counter that narrative and counter that uh, politics. So we wanted to march today to say no to xenophobia. We wanted to march to say inclusivity, diversity, welcoming, and let's have dialogue. Let's not have engage in violence. Let's not engage in division and hatred against each other simply because we're from different countries. To come and encourage young youth children to come here to support us because uh, there's a lot of things that are happening in different schools and we don't know how we're going to support that. So I just came here to support the because um, uh, I came here for xenophobic and this is my right and I have the right to come here for freedom. Among the marchers were foreign nationals and South African citizens, and their destination was the Hillbrow Police Station, as well as the Johannesburg Central Police Station, to hand over their memorandum of demands. Meanwhile, on the other side of the divide were supporters of the Operation Dudula movement, who also protested outside the Johannesburg Central Police Station, where their leader, Mr. Mthantla Lux Klamini, was being held. His case of alleged theft and malicious damage to property had been postponed to Monday, the 28th of March. And Monday came and Mr. Tlamini eventually appeared at the Rudiport's Magistrate's Court for his bail application, which was granted to the tune of 1,500 rand, to the delight of the huge crowd that awaited him outside the court. This is the time that we live and die for our people. Yeah. South Africans, yeah. even those who hate us yeah. must benefit from our leadership. Yeah. Even those who despise us must benefit from our leadership. Yeah. Even those who came and collected us from wherever we were to arrest us, they will in future benefit from our leadership. We are extremely ecstatic that Uncata Lux is out because, as I say, we are not xenophobic, we are not against Africans, but it's about time we normalize and we make noise about drug peddling. The case against the Operation Dudula movement leader will be coming up on the 27th of May. Meanwhile, his passport is being held by the authorities, but his request to move beyond Houting province was granted. And this paves the way for an earlier planned launch of the movement in another province, which was abandoned because he was remanded in custody. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. Kenya's food vendors are feeling the bite of the soaring flour and gas prices as the conflict between the world's two big grain and energy exporters enters the fifth week. The prices of flour and liquefied gas, the two imported essentials for Kenya's vend food vendors like Peter Kobe, have been skyrocketing over the past month. Kobe, 23, comes from a mountainous area in western Kenya. 
He arrived in the capital, Nairobi, a year ago to work as a chef at a breakfast eatery. He makes chapati, a with-based leavened flatbread and fried triangle-shaped pastry, which is popular breakfast food in Kenya. For Kobe and the likes, they have been forced to swallow the soaring cost of ingredients such as flour and cooking oil in recent weeks. Previously, we were buying the packet 140. For now, it is 180. For the salad, we used to buy around 180 per liter. But for now, 300 shillings, it's really tough for us. Besides the ingredients, the price of liquefied gas has almost doubled, forcing Kobe to seek for an alternative fuel option. With raging operating costs, Kobe is suffering substantial income loss, making it more difficult to support his family. Having lost his father when he was in grade two at the primary school, Kobe is now the breadwinner to his mother and three sisters who are back in their hometown. I am the one whom they are depending on. Previously, I was getting around 1,000 shillings. For now, I do five, uh, half of that. At the beginning of March, the price of 13 kilograms of liquefied gas, which can last two weeks, has risen from 2,700 shillings to 3,340, up around 20 percent. The staples we have in Kenya are wheat. Wheat is used to make bread, is to make chapati, is to make all these things. Um, 80 percent of wheat in Kenya is imported from many countries, and one of the biggest suppliers is Russia. As a country that heavily depends on imported food, the escalating conflict between Russia and Ukraine, two major food exporters, has posed a severe challenge to Kenya. Rwanda wants additional funding to keep its troops in Mozambique's troubled northern Cabo Delgado region where they are fighting Islamist militants. A 1,000-strong Rwandan force was deployed to the region last year and has since recaptured many villages and towns from the militants. Rwandan High Commissioner to Mozambique says they had asked the European Union for financial support for the troops to bring the situation in the region under control. According to the commissioner, there are visible improvements in areas recaptured by Rwandan troops, adding that there is no deadline for Rwandan troops' presence in the country. A summit bringing Israel together with Egypt, Morocco and two other Arab countries is taking place in the Negev Desert in Israel. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is also taking part in the meeting, which is expected to focus on the revival of the Iran nuclear deal and the war in Ukraine. Foreign ministers from Egypt, the UAE, Morocco and Bahrain have traveled to Israel for the event in a sign of their commitment to a new relationship with Israel. Five ancient tombs from the Old Kingdom have been uncovered in Egypt's Saqqara necropolis, some complete with burial shafts belonging to the era's top officials. Each tomb carries very important titles because they were rulers of the provinces whose influence became stronger around the end of the Old Kingdom in Egypt. Archaeologists have uncovered five ancient tombs adorned with well-preserved paintings at a cemetery in Saqqara, just outside the Egyptian capital, Cairo. This is the tomb of Hanu, who lived towards the end of the Old Kingdom and the beginning of the First Intermediate Period. The tomb is wonderful with the inscriptions and the colors. We are talking about nearly 4,000 years ago. Located near the pyramid of King Merenri I, they also contain large stone coffins, wooden coffins, and other artifacts, including small statues and pottery. This tomb belongs to a goddess with the title of the Lady of the Holy Land, which we see in the hieroglyphics. Here, on the western side, this is a painting showing the pots containing the seven oils, including the oil of the altar, the oil of life, and the oil of happiness. Saqqara, which lies south of the Great Pyramids of Giza, has provided a rich seam of archaeological discoveries in recent years.
Gilbert F. Humbo was elected by the ILO's governing body comprising representatives of governments, workers and employers during their meeting in Geneva. He will be the 11th Director General of the ILO and the first African to hold the position. He is currently President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and was formerly ILO Director. Deputy Director General for Field Operations and Partnerships and the Prime Minister of Togo. Well, the new Director General's term is to begin on October 1st, 2022. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, as you could uh, um, imagine, I'm so um, overwhelmed uh, by, this, uh, um, by this vote, which is a, a sign of trust, a trust that I don't take for granted. So I um, um, just want to say thank you um, to all, all the uh, member states, the social partners who have uh, um, globally um, um, elected, uh, elected me. Obviously, um, elections are now over, are behind us. Um, the direct you know, for everybody and everyone is going to be quite uh, important. So I um, still have to um, realize what is happening on, on, on that. Um, I've been uh, running this uh, race uh, based on my inner beliefs. Um, as I always say, that uh, um, there has been a lot of progress in the world, particularly since uh, World War II. But the social justice agenda uh, remained a challenge for us, um, um, couple with uh, climate change uh, as well as the economic opportunities generated by uh, transformation in the uh, scientific and technologic world. So we really need to push, uh, press the different um, agenda to ensure that economic progress is uh, equitably distributed among the different tranches, the different um, segments of our, of our society. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke.